In this video, I'm going to be showing you some evidence about the obesity epidemic in the United States. So we're going to be showing the CDC obesity maps. Um, so let's go ahead and get to it. Um, if you want to get this data for yourself, you can um, go to the website in this QR code. I'll also put a link to the website, the CDC website um, that has this data in the description below this video. Um, but basically what we're looking at here is um, starting in 2011, uh, they do have data before 2011, um, but they use a different methodology, so you can't really compare um, the previous data to this data and beyond, which is what we're doing in this uh, video. Uh, but I'll put an, a link in the description below uh, also to an older video of mine where I, I took all of the data available at that time and put it into one video, but it's a, it's a voiceless video, so this is going to be with some narration. But anyways, here we have um, the 2011 uh, obesity uh, data from the CDC. This is based on body mass index or BMI. And you can see that um, pretty much all the states are participating. Uh, well, actually, all the states are participating in, in this year. And um, most of them are somewhere in the, say, 20% to you know 30%, uh, maybe up to 35% for some of the states um, in the South, as well as a little bit of the Midwest, um, as far as the percent of the population that has obesity. All right, so we're gonna now cycle through from year to year, uh, starting in, uh, here again in 2011 up to 2019, which is the most recent data on the CDC website as of uh, me recording this. All right, so here we have 2012. You're seeing a little bit of a progression here um, where we're getting uh, much more of the South and Midwest uh, showing that 30 to 35% um, obesity rates uh, for those states. Um, and we're progressing now into 2013. We have states now starting to show the greater than 35%, starting with Mississippi and West Virginia. And a good portion of the map is now in this 30 to 35% range, where uh, only a handful of states are in this 20 to 25% range that originally had a decent uh, representation on the map. Up to 2014, Again, this uh, this light green color, or I guess not light green, the light green wasn't on the map from the beginning. The, the under 20% was not there even in 2011. But anyways, this, this green color is slowly uh, fading away, but it's still holding on. But a lot more of the country is now in the 30 to 35% uh, obesity prevalence uh, rates. And we have another, con uh, another uh, state, Arkansas, jumping in in the 35% and above uh, category. 2015, marching along even more, Louisiana, Alabama, um, uh, now in that uh, greater than 35% category. 2016, um, the green color is almost completely gone. Everything is pretty much 25% uh, uh, obesity prevalence rates or higher, most of it being the 30 to 35% category. 2017, progresses even more, 2018 progresses even more, up to 2019, which again is the, the newest data that the CDC website has currently um, on their website. Um, and you see that there's basically just uh, Washington DC, which is essentially just a single city, um, and Colorado are the only two states left in that 20 to 25% category. Almost the entire map is at 30 to, uh, uh, or at least 30% obesity rates or above. There's a handful left in the 25 to 30% range, but this is what we're talking about when we talk about the obesity epidemic. So let's kind of compare these uh, across time. This is a GIF uh, image showing uh, mar the march from 2011 to 2019. Uh, but here's 2011, here's 2019. You can see a progressive darkening and reddening, which with the way they do their maps, it means um, greater obesity prevalence. So again, this is the obesity epidemic. This is what we're talking about when people say the obesity epidemic. It's a slow progression over time. It's, I guess it's not super slow because it's something that's measurable year by year um, where we're getting higher and higher obesity rates so within the United States. And this isn't just the United States. This is happening in other countries around the world. Most countries um, where uh, there's a fair amount of income, uh, uh, median incomes fairly high, are going to have issues with uh, obesity at this point in time. Um, so 
let's get some summary data here. So again, here's that 2019 map, uh, the 2017 to 2018 uh, data collection period is the most recent that the CDC has on their website for sort of summarizing it. Uh, so it doesn't include this year 2019, but 42.5% of the total U.S. population um, was considered obese based on a BMI or body mass index of 30 or greater. There was 31.1% of the population was overweight. This is the category for BMI between 25 and basically 30. And then if you combine those two together, 73.6% of the population is either overweight or obese. Um, and so that doesn't leave a whole lot of the, you know, the, the slice of the U.S. population left. Most of the U.S. population is either overweight or obese. Um, that leaves about 25% of the population that is not. Keep in mind that if you look at the BMI um, scale, there's still the underweight category that would be in that, that remaining, you know, 26 and 0.4 or so percent. Um, so if you were to be able to take that out, which I don't have that data, the CDC, as far as I know, don't, doesn't provide that. Um, we're probably looking at less than a quarter of the population that has a normal weight um, uh, in the United States. So that's, those are really uh, stark numbers. Um, and what's even more dramatic is that this is, so this these values are across all racial and ethnic groups. Some of the racial and ethnic groups are actually um, uh, seeing even worse numbers than uh, the general population is doing. Uh, so why do we care about this? Um, there are a number of diseases related to obesity. Uh, so people with obesity are more likely to get the diseases or conditions on this list. So hypertension, type 2 diabetes, coronary heart disease, stroke, uh, gallbladder disease, uh, osteoarthritis, sleep apnea, um, a handful of cancers, and then uh, again, this is a this is a very short list. This list could be much much longer than this. Um, it, there's a lot of other conditions that are also linked to um, having a high amount of body mass or body fat, and so uh, obesity is something that we do need to try to combat against as a society, and also those of us in the exercise and sort of health professions, it's something we need to be aware of and try to um, uh, combat against in our, our careers. Definitely something that we need to know is there and we need to also learn how to measure it and how to uh, sort of, com again, combat against it. Um, the next video I'll be uh, putting out and I'll be linking to it in the description below this once I am able to get that out is going to be on some basic anthropometric measurements um, that are often used in order to assess uh, weight status, uh, BMI being the big one, um, as well as different ways of carrying weight that may increase uh, cardiovascular disease risk um, one way or another. So um, go ahead and check out those links below if you want to see any of those videos. In this video, we're going to be covering some basic anthropometric measurements that are useful in order to determine if somebody is at an elevated risk for obesity-related diseases like cardiovascular disease. Body mass index, or BMI, is basically just a height and weight um, ratio where you take, uh, actually it's weight first, so it's weight in kilograms divided by the height of the person in meters squared. So you're gonna do height times itself uh, in meters. And when you do this, you're gonna get a single number that is in kilogram meters squared. These numbers here are all for adults. If you have a BMI of less than 18.5, you would be considered underweight as an adult. Um, the normal range is 18.5 to 24.9. Overweight then starts at 25 and goes up to 29.9. Obesity, um, class one, um, so basically obesity in general as well, starts at 30. Uh, obesity class one those goes from 30 to 34.9, class two, 35 to 39.9, and then class three would be 40 and above. Um, so these, uh, this is actually the most commonly uh, used method for establishing whether or not somebody has obesity. Um, and uh, there are some flaws to it, and we should uh, be aware of those. Uh, the, the big ones being if you have somebody who's heavily muscled, uh, think like an athlete who might um, carry a lot more muscle on their frame than the average individual, um, it's going to make them look like they're uh, on the higher end of this scale than what they truly should be um, based on how much body fat they have. Um, so they're more likely to end up in the sort of the overweight category um, when they really should you know, be considered more normal weight. 
Um, the other end of the spectrum where there's also some issues is people who uh, lack having much muscle mass, but they do have a fair amount of fat mass. So if somebody is under muscled, uh, but maybe over uh, fat in, uh, well, they have too much fat, they are going to look as though they're normal weight because they have weight on them. That weight just happens to be body fat, um, not muscle. Uh, and even though they have too much body fat, um, because they have a small amount of muscle mass, Again, they end up looking like their normal weight. So those are the sort of two extreme ends of the spectrum. The first one being the probably the more common issue um, with young people. The second one being something that you're probably more likely going to see um, as you start getting into the elderly population where uh, muscle mass is wasted a little bit, um, but fat mass has sort of been maintained or even increased. Even though body mass index has these, these issues I just mentioned, it's still a really good measurement for most people, especially sedentary people. Most people, this the body mass index is going to categorize them uh, relatively accurately. Um, so it's something that kind of gets bashed a lot within the exercise profession, um, uh, mostly because a lot of people who exercise do tend to have more muscle mass. But outside of that uh, that group of uh, heavily muscled individuals in the exercise exercise profession it, it's a quite a good measurement and it's not something that should be overlooked all right so let's get to another uh, common anthropometric measurement and that is uh, circumference measurements uh, specifically uh, we're going to talk about waist circumference and then the waist hip ratio which means you have to measure the, the hip cir circumference as well um, the uh, either one of these is going to use uh, a type of flexible tape. Often it's going to be a gullet tape measure where you have this spring-loaded cylinder that tells you if you're sort of pulling it um, at the right level of tension because if you pull too hard, you make the person look uh, smaller than they are, where if you're not pulling hard enough, you make them look maybe a little bigger than they are. You might get a little extra slack in the flexible tape measure. Um, but anyway, so... The waist measurement, uh, which is done on the abdomen most commonly, is going to be uh, considered uh, elevated and means that the person's at an elevated risk of having cardiovascular disease at some point in the future. Uh, for men, uh, equal to or greater than 102 centimeters or 40 inches would put them in this sort of elevated risk category. For women, equal to or greater than 88 centimeters or 35 inches would also put them in the elevated cardiovascular disease risk category. Um, we're highlighting the waist. It's probably the most commonly used uh, site, but there are various other sites like the hip um, that, are, that can be done and are oftentimes done. Um, if you're gonna measure the waist and the hip, uh, it's, it's quite common to do a waist hip ratio. Uh, so just divide the waist value by the hip value and doing that gives you um, another chance to sort of check for uh, uh, elevation in cardiovascular disease risk. Uh, so if you are working with a relatively young individual and this uh, young's kind of a liberal term here because um, you know old basically starts around 60 years old so anybody under 60 would be um, most likely use these uh, cut points here. So equal to or greater than 0 0.95 um, for men would be considered at the elevated risk for cardiovascular disease. For, men, uh, for women, equal to or greater than 0 0.86. Again, we're talking about the ratio of waist to hip. Um, if you're talking older adults, so um, this is specifically 60 to 69 years old, um, you'd probably use this also um, slightly above that as well. Um, but equal to or greater than 1.03 for men, equal to or greater than 0 0.9 for women would give you that elevated cardiovascular disease risk. And the reason why this waist hip ratio is a fairly uh, important one to measure if, if you're able and you're looking for some sort of obesity uh, anthropometric measurements is the waist, as I already mentioned, is done on the abdomen, typically on the narrowest part of the abdomen, where the hip is typically done on the widest part of the, of the buttocks, so the butt. And um, that ratio of narrowest to biggest part of the body is going to give you, um, and it also happens to be the two places where people carry um, the most uh, body fat, it's going to give you an idea of where they're carrying body fat and specifically do they have what we call android obesity. Um, so 
let's go ahead and talk more about android obesity and its counterpart, um, which is gynoid obesity. So android obesity is the apple shape that a lot of uh, obese men tend to get. Um, women get it as well, but it's more common with men. Um, and this means they are storing more of their um, body fat in their trunk and their abdomen. And this leads to a greater risk of um, cardiovascular disease and other obesity related diseases than gynoid obesity, which means you're carrying the weight more in your hips, which is the, the more common obesity um, sort of phenotype for women. Uh, the reason why android obesity is more dangerous is it puts the fat in and around the major organs of the body that are uh, largely in the abdomen. And so if the organs are constantly surrounded by fat and uh, the fat sort of infiltrates into them, it can uh, have a greater likelihood of causing some issues in those organs as well as you know, then health issues because of that. Um, so again, uh, Android obesity is sort of the apple shaped, most of the, the you know, sort of barrel shaped uh, chest and abdomen that uh, are, is more common with men. Gynoid obesity is more the pear shape with more of the hips, uh, but in sort of lower waist um, that is uh, most often the obesity phenotype that women get. Um, and it's again less risky in terms of. Uh, the risk for um, cardiovascular disease in the future. I will put a link below this video uh, to uh, a video I've already done on how to measure waist and hip circumference and uh, so you can do that waist hip ratio. I'll also put a link below this video on how to uh, measure the height of a person, how to measure their weight so that you can do the body mass index. And I will put a link in the description below this video uh, to a video I'm about to release after this video doing, um, uh, we're talking about some uh, body composition measurements. So this was all uh, some of the most common uh, anthropometric measurements, which just means measuring sort of size and shape of the body, where um, if you can, you really want to measure body composition. So how much body fat percentage does the person have? Because it's, it's going to give you a little more detailed information. In this video, we're going to be doing a very basic overview of body fat percentage. We need to know a little bit about body composition. So body fat percentage is one part of that. So uh, we have fat-free mass, which would include the muscles, the bones, the organs, and everything basically then that is not fat in the person. And then we have fat mass, which would be the fat. So let's talk more about the fat-free mass for just for a moment though. Um, Typically for athletes, um, having greater fat-free mass means they're going to have greater muscle, maybe a little bit of bone, but mostly greater muscle mass. Um, so people, oh, athletes tend to want to increase their fat-free mass um, because it's good for most um, athletic events, not all, but most. Um, so it's going to be um, really, really good, obviously, for power and strength athletes as well as athletes that need a lot of local muscular endurance. Um, uh, it's not going to be quite as good for uh, some of the endurance-based athletes, think long distance running, um, because it leads to additional mass they have to carry over the course of the race. Some muscle mass is still good for those athletes, but maybe an excessive amount of muscle mass is not going to be helpful and might actually hinder those sports. Um, but for the most part, most athletes want to increase their lean muscle mass. Fat mass, on the other hand, um, is uh, something that is extra weight to carry um, during an athletic event. So most athletes want to decrease their, their fat mass to a healthy level, but to decrease it um, lower than what the average population tends to have. Um, uh, fat mass is good for some things, mostly for energy storage. There's a lot of ATP that can be liberated, which is our energy unit in our body. So there's a lot of energy in fat that can be liberated and used during athleticism or exercise. Um, and so we do need fat in our bodies in order to do that, both for uh, athletic reasons as well as health reasons. Um, but generally speaking, less fat usually means better athletic performance. Again, to a point. Um, most athletes, uh, uh, for men, are going to be between 5 and 15% body fat. For women, are going to be between 10 and 18% body fat. 
Um, so this is sort of just generic athlete profiles. Um, keep in mind, uh, as I've already alluded to, you do need body fat and you don't want to be too low with body fat because you can start running into um, various issues with uh, your health as well as with exercise performance. Um, so there's a term called essential fat, which basically means the minimal amount of fat the person can have with having normal bodily functions. Um, now this does vary by person, so not everybody can get as low as the values on this screen, but these are the values from the ACSM's uh, primary textbook, the, their guidelines textbook. Uh, so for men below 3% body fat, you're likely going to start seeing um, some health and physiological issues. For women below um, 10 to 13 percent it's a little bit of range there again because not everybody's the same and some there's some discrepancy in uh, the data out there so below these essential fat levels you should definitely expect to see some negative health consequences for some people there are negative health consequences above these levels and this is actually something we're getting uh, much more aware of in the exercise uh, research community, um, things like the female athlete triad and also now the male athlete triad that they're uh, starting to recognize in uh, research as well is when people have uh, consistently low body fats and it can lead to some issues with hormonal balances and um, bone density and various things like that. But in sticking to just what um, is in the sort of ACSM guidelines right now, don't go below 13, oh, 3% for men, 10 to 13% for women. Um, uh, being a little bit above, that's probably a good thing. All right, so um, for health purposes though, so this is not talking about athleticism at this point, just sort of a general population, um, the ACSM considers it satisfactory for men to be between uh, 12 and 23% body fat and for women to be between 17 and 26% body fat. Um, and I say the satisfactory with the, the quotes because um, there is not a standard that everybody agrees to about what is considered good body fat percentage. This is the reason why we don't generally use body fat percentage in order to identify if somebody is considered obese or overweight. Um, we more use it as a way of determining what their percentile rank is or a categorical rank specific to the percentile rank for body fat. Again, we don't typically use this to determine if someone's overweight or obese. We would use uh, body mass index or BMI uh, more commonly to do that. I've already have a video talking about the basic anthropometric uh, measurements, so I'll put a link in the description below this to that video. As exercise professionals, we need to be uh, looking out for signs of eating disorders. Um, it's very common in some sports for people to have eating disorders, especially the sports where a leaner physique tends to lead to greater exercise performance. Um, so think uh, long distance running, um, cycling, uh, all the uh, aesthetic uh, type activities and sports, think cheerleading, uh, gymnastics, they oftentimes will um, have very low body fat percentages and uh, sometimes that can be driven by disordered eating. So it's uh, again, if you're working with those athletes, it's something to be aware of. Um, there are concerns with having a very high or very low body fat percentage. So um, above normal body fat percentages uh, means a greater likelihood of obesity or obesity-related illnesses. So um, things like cardiovascular disease, diabetes, um, and several others. Being below normal, uh, so being sort of under fat um, leads uh, to a greater likelihood that the person might have some sort of eating disorder like anorexia nervosa or bulimia nervosa. Um, it also increases the likelihood of the athlete triad, so both the male and female athlete triad. Um, and so those are all very serious conditions as well that you would want to avoid. And there are other ones as well that um, are associated with low body fat percentage that could cause some issues with further health. Um, this is just sort of ones to look out for. With that in mind, yeah, you need to be able to determine what the optimal weight of the person would be if they were to achieve the body fat percentage that they're looking for. Um, and that body fat percentage should be something they look up in some sort of normative chart um, based typically around the, the good categories, uh, good to maybe excellent categories where you want to be for most uh, people, both for health and, and fitness reasons. Um, and so uh, in order to calculate optimal body uh, weights, you need to know their fat-free weights and uh, again, their target 
um, body fat percentage, uh, which you know they may or may not be their optimal body fat percentage. Um, so in order to calculate fat-free weights, um, you would do uh, their current weight minus their current weight times their current body fat percentage. So again, you need to do their body fat percentage uh, measurements, so body composition measurement, in order to do this. So this, these are some basic calculations that may be useful um, if you are doing body fat percentage on a person. I'll put links in the description below this video for example calculations on how to do optimal body weight um, uh, calculations, both by body fat percentage, and you can do a, a version of that using uh, body mass index as well if you aren't doing body fat percentage. It's not as good, but it's something you can do. Um, I'll also put a link in the description below to uh, the video I've already done on anthropometric measurements um, that are a little simpler than these measurements I showed here, and they're also quite a bit cheaper and quicker. All right, let's switch gears now and start talking about how um, people assess body fat percentage. And we're not gonna show how to do each one of these, but we're gonna talk about the pros and cons quickly of each one so you can determine which one may be a, a good one to use in different situations. All right, so this is a list of some of the most common methods of doing body fat uh, assessment or body composition assessment. There are certainly other ones out there, a lot that I'm not uh, showing on here, like uh, MRI, ultrasound, um, various 3D scans of the body. Um, there's a lot of them. This is something that is consistently getting new techniques developed. Um, but again, these are the common ones. So dual energy X-ray absorption geometry or DEXA, um, that is probably the current gold standard for this, um, excluding MRI, which is probably as good, if not a little bit better than uh, the DEXA, but it's not used outside of research settings often because it's so expensive. Even DEXA is typically only used in clinical or research settings, which is why it's, uh, it's useful as a gold standard to compare the results of some of these other ones too. Um, but it's, it's good for assessing body fat percentage, uh, of course, but also lean tissue because it can see the lean tissue, it can see bone, it can see mineral, it can see fat mass. Um, next one on the list, hydrostatic or underwater weighing. This was the gold standard for a very long time. Underwater weighing um, is still a good measurement. Um, it's not used as frequently as it used to because um, it's uh, been sort of surpassed by DEXA and also the next one on this list here, which is air displacement plethysmography. Um, the only system I'm aware of for air displacement plethysmography is the BOD pod system. It's, it's fairly common in your high-end facilities and your academic and research facilities. Um, both of these measurements, as well as the skin fold measurement that we're going to talk about in a second, are going to uh, calculate body density. And from body density, you can calculate body fat using an equation similar to the Siri equation I have listed here. But there are other equations that will also go from body density to body fat. Um, so these are not actually body fat measurements, they're body density measurements. But again, we're, we typically use them to assess body fat. All right, so. The next one, as I already quickly mentioned, was skin folds, measuring the subcutaneous fat under the skin by pinching the person. Um, and then biological impedance analysis, or BIA, um, is another one uh, that's uh, commonly done. And it, it, it's going to determine um, how much fat the person has. Also, it's very useful for estimating how much uh, body water the person has. And um, these two down here are your typical um, field or gym based measurements where these ones up here are uh, usually uh, only going to be seen in very high end facilities or research or clinical settings. Um, but we're going to talk about each one of these in a little more detail. So DEXA here, the dual energy x-ray absorption geometry, and you can see an image that you would get from DEXA machine. Um, you can see the skeleton. This was originally used uh, only for, or maybe not only for, but it was originally designed in order to measure bone density, and it's still used for this all the time in clinical settings. But as you can see in this second picture, you can also look at tissues. 
and so your soft tissues and so you based on the sort of density of the the coloring here you can sort of pick out fats versus lean tissues and um, you can even see the lungs in here and so it's useful for looking at um, soft tissues as well and this is what a, a typical DEXA machine looks like and um, it's got this wand that's kind of sort of scan um, over the person or a specific segment of the person um, using x-ray type uh, waves and so um, again you can get all kinds of different measurements from this this is just a short segment of what you can get some of the pros to this, uh, again, it quantifies bone as well as the soft tissues. So it can give you a measure of bone density, which is uh, health for health reasons is, is very useful, um, which clinically is probably more common to use DEXA for that rather than body fat percentage. Um, highly precise, highly reliable, which is why it is that gold standard. And I had it with the three different stars on the, the previous slide. Uh, some cons to DEXA, very, very expensive. Um, so these machines are probably going to be starting somewhere around $35,000 a piece. Um, and they can go up into, you know, well over $100,000, $200,000 if you want sophisticated measurements from them. Um, another uh, issue with DEXA is it does use a low dose of um, radiation. Uh, it is based on x-rays, which gives radiation. So... Um, some states are going to uh, make it very difficult to use a DEX machine, others will not. Um, currently, New Jersey, which is where I'm at at the moment, um, is a, a state that highly regulates DEXA, and you need to have a special um, education and license in order to run a DEXA machine. If I go over the border into Pennsylvania, the rules are much more liberal there about DEXA machines. And basically anybody can learn how to use it in a few minutes and then use it on people. Um, so it's much more commonly used in states like that because of the, the looser regulations. Um, I don't know the exact numbers here, but when I've talked to people um, from companies that make these uh, types of machines, now keep in mind it's coming from someone who sells them the equipment, but I've been told that the dose of radiation would be equivalent to eating like a, you know, four bananas or something like that. Cause it's bananas have potassium that has a radioactive component to it. Um, so we're talking about a very, very low dose of radiation in most DEXA machines. Um, and so it's probably not a, a big concern, but um, again, some governmental bodies have decided to regulate it uh, pretty tightly. So it's not, is easily accessible in some states as others. Here's our underwater weighing or hydrostatic weighing. For this, you'd weigh the person on dry land. You'd have to assess their um, how much volume is in their lungs because you're always gonna have a little bit of trapped air that has to be uh, taken into account um, here. And then you put them underwater and you weigh what uh, weigh them under the water. You, so you see the difference in their weight on dry land versus uh, wetland. Uh, or underwater, and from that we're able to calculate body density. Um, it's basically a displacement measurement because you're displacing water, and how much water you displace is going to determine your buoyancy in the water. Um, so, um, sort of basic understanding here: uh, muscle is heavier than water, fat is lighter than water. So, if you have more body fat, you're going to float more. You're going to look lighter underwater. Then if you have less body fat or, or more muscle mass, you would, you would sink more. Um, that's the very basics of this. Um, so some of the limitations of hydrostatic weighing is it does have the confounding effect of air volume that's in your lungs because air also causes buoyancy and causes you to float, uh, which is why when you go under the water, you have to blow out as much air as you can, but you still have residual volume of air in your lungs that you can't get out. It's always trapped in your lungs. That's normal. It's part of normal, healthy pulmonary uh, physiology. So there's always a little bit of air trapped, which is why you need to either measure the residual volume of the person or estimate it through some form of uh, voluntary uh, expiratory uh, capacity test. Some other pretty obvious limitations, hopefully that aren't listed here, is that you are being forced to go underwater. So you're, um, you're getting wet, you're typically wearing a um, bathing suit. So that might make some people uncomfortable. Um, when you're under the water and you're blowing out all your air, a lot of people do start to get a little um, 
uh, claustrophobic. The, the tanks tend to be pretty small, as you can see here. Uh, they kind of need to be to keep the water stable and not have it sort of uh, bouncing around and making waves that make it hard to read the, the weights. Um, so all those things can be uh, things that make some people nervous when they're having this test done and uh, might make it unpleasant for them. All right, so uh, this, uh, as I already mentioned, is a hydro, uh, the hydrostatic weighing test is a body density test, not a body fat percentage test. And so I have it listed here as a limitation because you have to do a conversion from body density to body fat, which isn't a big deal. It's pretty easy. You know, it's like a couple step or uh, equation or something like that. Um, but everybody's body density is a little different. So if you assume a certain body density for a person and you end up being wrong, it can lead to errors in the body fat percentage calculation. And this is going to be an issue with any of the body density based um, body fat uh, assessment measurements. So um, it's not just this one that has the issue. All right, so um, again, fat-free density does vary amongst uh, different people. On to air displacement plethysmography. Uh, again, bod pod is the only method of this that I'm aware of. Uh, if you know of uh, another machine out there that does this, uh, I would love to know about it. So you know, put a comment below so I can I can learn about it. Um, but bod pods are fairly common. They they're uh, in a lot of high-end fitness facilities and athletic facilities, and they're in a lot of research and academic institutions. Um, this is the bod pod. Um, you can see it's got this sort of egg shape to it. Um, it uses similar concepts as underwater weighing, but instead of displacing water and measuring your buoyancy, you're displacing air, and there's a sort of bladder behind him. Uh, there's behind this wall here that's going to be able to assess the, the volume of the air that you're displacing. Um, and so um, it's got those same issues with, you know, you're measuring body density here again, and um, uh, the various issues associated with uh, going from body density to body fat percentage. Uh, it is much easier for these uh, the participants than underwater wing because they don't need to get wet. They don't have to blow out all their air. You do have to assess air volume in some way uh, in their lungs, uh, the, the volume, um, or do some sort of uh, general prediction equation, which is uh, probably more common. Um, but uh, it is much easier on the person than underwater wing is. Um, so um, there's that benefit. Some of the negative sides, though, is uh, you do have to wear minimal clothes, um, and uh, you really should cover or uh, shave off any hair that is exposed, um, because anything that traps air is going to in, uh, actually increase the error of the test. So notice he has a, a cap on his head, uh, compressing his hair. Um, he should have his hair on his chest shaved. Um, we, we didn't in this case, but typically you, you should, especially if it's like a, a, a clinical or research measurement where you need uh, a lot of accuracy to it. Um, you can't see it, but he's wearing compression shorts, obviously has his shirt off. Um, so women would have some sort of sports bra or bathing suit on while doing this, similar to what would be done with the underwater wing. It's also fairly expensive. These machines are going to cost you somewhere between probably fifty dollars and $55,000 to buy. So not something that your typical um, general fitness facility is going to be able to afford. So we've talked a lot about different uh, methods of doing body fat percentage assessment, but up until now, all the techniques I've talked about were lab-based techniques. I'm going to put a link in the description of this video to another video where I talk about field-based techniques. Up till now, all of the body composition uh, techniques I've talked about have been uh, considered gold standards at one point in time or currently. Um, these two on this slide, the skin folds is shown here is pinching the skin and measuring the, the skin and fats uh, or biological impedance analysis, BIA, where you use electricity through the body in order to assess body fat. These are not and have never been considered gold standards. These are your field or sort of typical gym-based measurements. These are the most commonly used ones of all the measurements I'm showing uh, on, in this video. Um, so skin folds, 
probably the most common one, uh, spe uh, especially if you kind of go back in time a little bit uh, where these machines uh, are uh, coming down in price and becoming more capable. Uh, skin folds have been around a lot longer. When doing skin folds, uh, you're going to be, as I already mentioned, pinching the person and measuring how thick that pinch is. Uh, so this is a little dial that has millimeters of thickness on it. And you are gonna do at least three sites um, some of the equations out there are going to be five site equations. Uh, some of the equations are seven site equations. There are sites beyond the seven sites um, uh, equations so that you can do more than seven sites, but uh, three, five, and seven site equations are the most commonly used ones. Um, if you practice the technique and you have experience doing, uh, doing it in lots of different people that who's you know, their body tissues have different textures and different feels, uh, you can get fairly accurate with this. So you can get within about 3.5% as a sort of a plus or minus range. That means if you measure them around, say, 10% body fat, they might be somewhere between 6.5% or 13.5%, so plus or minus 3.5%. That'll, that'll be about 68% of the people are in that range. Um, so basically one standard deviation on either side of the, the bell-shaped curves mean um, for those who've had the statistics already. Um, and so um, fairly accurate, not as good as the gold standard measurements that have already shown the DEXA, the underwater weighing, the bod pod, but fairly accurate in uh, something that is much easier and cheaper to do in a fitness setting. So these calipers a good set is going to run probably between two and four hundred dollars. Um, compare that to the several thousands or tens of thousands of dollars for the other ones I've shown so far. Much, much cheaper and more affordable. All right, let's talk about um, bioelectrical impedance analysis or BIA. Uh, this has an accuracy of between 2.7 and uh, 6.3%. Um, the changes based on which study you look at. It doesn't have the issues of having to touch a person or them having to remove clothes in order to get to the various skin fold sites, so that's nice. Um, it, but there are some issues which we'll get to uh, once we quickly talk about how this works. Uh, so as I already mentioned though, you're gonna be sending electricity into the body. It goes up through the body, and this, this is a foot-to-foot -foot version, so it goes up through one foot, down the other foot and it is sensed in these metal electrodes on the other side. As it goes through the body, um, there's going to be various tissues that have to conduct that electrical current. That free mass is a very good conductor of electricity because it has a lot of water and electrolytes in it. So think uh, muscle uh, in various tissues that are lean tissues like that. They are going to have lots of water in them. So that means they're gonna be good conductors of electricity. Fat mass has very little water to it. Um, fat and uh, water don't mix very well. And so it's going to be a very poor conductor of electricity because it's not gonna have a lot of water in there. Therefore, it's not gonna have a lot of those electrolytes that are in the water typically within the body. And so um, uh, if you just understand this much, uh, lean tissues are good conductors. Fat tissue is a poor conductor of electricity. That means that the less impedance you have to the um, electrical current going through your body, the less body fat you probably have. Um, so that's the sort of basis of this. Some of the issues with this is it's going to be highly dependent on the hydration status of the individual. So if they're dehydrated in any way or even overhydrated, so the opposite end of the spectrum in any way, that's gonna cause lots of problems for this measurement and you're gonna be well with, uh, well outside of this standard error, the estimate range that I'm showing here if you have a hydration issue, so under or over hydrated. So you have to just be sort of you hydrated or normal hydrated. Um, so if the person exercises beforehand, if they've been exposed to a lot of heat beforehand, even if they haven't become dehydrated, but they've been exposed to heat and then that shifts the fluids to the skin, where they're trying, their body's basically trying to dissipate some of the heat, that shift in fluids and where it is in the body is also going to cause some issues with bioelectrical impedance analysis. If the person eats and there's a shift of fluids to the abdomen, so blood going to the abdomen, abdomen to help with um, digestion, also going to cause issues with BIA. So if you follow all the pretesting guidelines, this is about your error range that you're gonna have, so plus or minus, um, 2.7 to 6.3%. Um, 
if you don't follow all its pre-testing guidelines, biological opinions analysis is probably going to be a useless measurement. Uh, so this is not a measurement that should be done after a, the workout. So you'll see in fitness centers, a lot of times these machines will be just kind of out in the open and people will go work out and they'll try to weigh uh, themselves or jump on the biological impedance scale like this in order to see what their body fat percentage is. It's going to give them a, total, a totally bogus number if they do that. Um, so it's not something you should do post-exercise. So we've talked a lot about different uh, methods of doing body fat percentage assessment. I'll put links in the description below this video on several other videos showing how to do the techniques described in this video. In this video, we're going to be doing a quick overview, a very, very basic overview of the major dietary macronutrients. Just right before we talk about the macronutrients, I just want to mention the idea of micronutrients because you shouldn't learn macronutrients without being aware of micronutrients. Um, micronutrients are those uh, various nutrients that we need in very small quantities where macronutrients are the nutrients we need in very large quantities. Um, so when we think uh, micronutrients, you should be thinking uh, vitamins and minerals mostly. Or with macronutrients, um, we are talking about water, carbohydrates, fat, and protein. Water is actually the macronutrient that we need the most of. People oftentimes don't think of water as a macronutrient because it doesn't have calories in it, um, but we do need a lot of water in our diet. Um, there are consequences to hypohydration, which is the term for having not enough water in our body, essentially. Oftentimes, people use the term dehydration to mean the same thing. It takes about a 2% drop in our body water in order for our thirst mechanism to engage for, for most individuals. So if you only lose 1% or 1.5%, you're probably not going to feel thirsty. Um, so for exercise reasons, um, your thirst may or may not always be the best mechanism to go by in order to make sure that you're maintaining proper hydration in order to maintain your performance. And the reason for that is once you're at three to 4% of water loss, um, you're now going to start having exercise performance decrements. So your exercise performance is going to get worse. Um, and the more you lose, the worse that exercise performance is going to become. And of course, if you lose too much water, you can start running into issues, uh, health-based issues, and it can also increase the likelihood of various heat illnesses uh, like heat stroke, um, which can be deadly. The adequate intake for water for women is about 2.7 liters per day. For men, it's 3.7 liters per day. Um, this is an adequate intake recommendation. This is not uh, the um, best uh, recommendation that we potentially have was not enough uh, sort of evidence to give a specific number to this um, because the water needs of people vary quite a bit from person to person and from one situation to another you know think of somebody in a hotter environment or a more dry arid environment versus somebody in a more humid environment um, or a, a more temperate environment all those different situations are going to change how much water you need um, if you are exercising in a hot environment, especially if it's a hot humid environment, you're going to have a much greater need for water because you're going to be sweating a lot. And the sweat is the primary way we uh, lose body water. And so it's very easy for you to lose, you know, seven or more liters per day of water if you are exercising or working in hot, in hot environments. And so this 2.7 and 3.7 liters per day, it's the general um, recommendation, would not, would not be sufficient for somebody who is working or exercising in hot environments. Some common sources of water would be obviously our beverages, so the drinks we have. Um, on average, people bring in about one and a half liters per day as a drink. Um, solid foods do have some water in them, so about 0.75 liters per day, so three quarters of a liter per day is commonly brought in through food. And then our metabolic processes, so um, a lot of our processes that actually create energy within our bodies or bioenergetic processes can make water. And so we should be expecting to get around a quarter, uh, so 0 0.25 liters per day from our various bioenergetic processes. So I'll actually put a link below this um, to the playlist that I already have on bioenergetic um, processes. Um, so you can watch that sort of lecture series if you want. Um, anyway, so 
these are sort of fairly typical levels. Obviously, these levels need to change in, uh, if someone's exercising and sweating a lot or living or working in hot environments where they're sweating a lot. And so the primary way it's going to change, though, is through drinking water. So the beverages is the one that's most likely to go up quite a bit in those situations. Carbohydrates is the macronutrient we need the most of after water. Um, so um, carbohydrate also is um, one of the three macronutrients. Um, so most of them, um, the macronutrients that have calories in them. So we get about 4.1 kilocalories per gram of carbohydrates that we that we eat and consume. Um, and uh, so carbohydrates has a distinction uh, where um, we need these carbohydrates in order to fuel the brain in the, the central nervous system. So that includes the spinal cord, um, except in some special dietary situations or in people who have a low carbohydrate diet for various reasons, uh, whether it's by choice or for uh, clinical reasons, um, excluding those people the brain exclusively uses carbohydrates uh, for its fuel source. Again, excluding low carbohydrate intake diets. Um, so in a normal diet, the brain uses about 130 grams per day of glucose, which is the, the primary carbohydrate that their body uses. So it's about 533 calories or kilocalories per day that the brain and the spinal cord uses just in order to maintain the normal neurological processes that we use. The general recommendation for carbohydrates is to bring in between 45 and 65% of our total calories in carbohydrates. Um, and so uh, this is going to uh, have more specific recommendations for athletes, uh, where it's gonna be between three and 12 grams of carbohydrates per kilogram of body mass per day. There's quite a bit of range in this value uh, because it's gonna be different uh, based on how how much energy the person's using is uh, in their athletics or exercise, and also are they, um, you know, coming up to an event where they need to have a lot of glycogen stores? If so, they're probably going to eat on the higher end of this. I should mention here that dietary fiber, because it's non-digestible, does not have calories that our bodies are able to liberate, and so it is not uh, is not included in the calories that you see on a dietary label. And so you actually have to subtract out the dietary fiber from the total carbohydrates in order to figure out how many calories are coming from carbohydrates on a dietary label. After carbohydrates, the next macronutrient that we need in the highest quantity is going to be fats. Um, so we need 20 to 25% of our total calories to come from fat. And so um, fat is really great because it's uh, it's our uh, a great way of getting energy into our body. It is our primary energy source for rest as well as low intensity exercise. And we get about 9.4 kilocalories per gram of fat that we consume um, liberated in our body. A quick health note of talking about fats here is not all fats are the same. So diets that are rich in dietary cholesterol, saturated fats, and trans, fat, trans fats are going to increase our low density lipoproteins or LDL cholesterol within our blood and that increases the risk of cardiovascular disease. And so generally it's recommended that we uh, try to limit how much of these, that, these types of fats that we're consuming. The macronutrient that we actually need the least of, even though you know you, you might think otherwise if you look at some of the things in pop culture these days, uh, talking about diets, is uh, it's actually protein. We need less protein than we need carbohydrates, carbohydrates and fats. And um, the primary reason for this is it's, it's not it's a source of energy our body wants to use. It can use it for energy, and when it does, we get about 4.1 kilocalories of energy per gram that we consume. Um, but again, we don't want to use protein as an energy source. When we use protein as an energy source, we often are pulling that out of our skeletal muscle, which means we're going to deteriorate our muscles and organs um, because that's, that's the only reservoir for protein our bodies have, unlike carbohydrates and fats, which can be stored and used later on for energy. All right, so what are the health-based recommendations for protein consumption? 0.8 grams of protein per kilogram of body mass um, is the general recommendation for most Americans um, in order to maintain appropriate diets for health. 
There are some sport specific recommendations for protein though. So for general athletes that are exercising intensely, so this is only for athletes and exercise intensely, otherwise they should be using the general health recommendations. But for intensely exercising athletes, 1.2 to 1.7 grams of protein per kilogram of body mass per day is the recommendation. Um, if the exercise is intense and long, so think like long distance cycling, long distance running, um, the recommendation is 1.2 to 1.7 grams uh, per kilogram of body mass per day. Main reason being um, those endurance based athletes tend to use a little bit more protein for fuel. Um, the longer the exercise, the more likely they're, they're going to be using protein as a supplemental fuel. It's still not the primary, it's not even close to being a primary energy source, but we use a little bit more of it if we exercise for long durations. Um, the um, people who do intense and new, specifically new resistance exercise, uh, also need an elevated amount of protein and they're on this sort of higher range of the 1.2 to 1.7. So 1.6 to 1.7 grams of uh, protein per kilogram of body mass per day is a recommendation for people who are doing intense and new resistance exercise. So if you're doing the same resistance pl plan you've been doing for six months, you probably don't need to be in this range. You can be in the lower range for uh, athletes if it's intense. If it's not so intense, you should be using the health-based recommendations of 0 0.8 grams per kilogram of body mass. All right, so there is uh, there are some people who recommend uh, well above this range. Uh, the evidence does not show any real improvements in um, skeletal muscle building if you go above two grams uh, of protein per kilogram body mass per day. So going above two, you know, you'll see sometimes people recommending all the way up to about three grams of protein per kilogram of body mass per day. Um, but the rec but the evidence uh, that I'm aware of does not support going above two grams uh, per day. And really you probably don't need to go above this 1.6 to 1.7 grams per kilogram of body mass per day in order to build muscle mass. Um, this is probably sufficient for doing that still. In this video, we talked about macronutrients and gave some uh, general recommendations for macronutrients. We're going to talk about um, some various terminology that you should be aware of when thinking about your diets and looking at the uh, the recommendations from the government for your diet, which is a lot of what I showed in this, uh, this video. Um, so I'm going to put a link in the description below this video uh, for the video that I make talking about some of those other terminology uh, and various terms and uh, sources of information that you should be aware of. In this video, I'm going to be going over some basic terminology that you need to be aware of when you are thinking about your diet and following the guidelines given out by the US government in order to maintain a healthy diet. One of the terms you need to be aware of is the dietary reference intakes or the DRIs. These are categories of nutrient need recommendations that are, uh, that are meant to maintain proper health and physiological function. This is not based on um, special conditions, so special clinical conditions, or um, maybe special conditions related to exercise um, that are, or something like that, where somebody might need a little more of a nutrient than somebody else. So these are meant for, for basic health-based uh, recommendations here. All right, so the first uh, category of a DRI is called the estimated average requirement or the EAR. And this is the uh, level of need of some, whatever nutrient you're talking about. It's the level of need that would satisfy 50% of the population. So the bottom half of the population uh, for that nutrient. So if we look at this uh, sort of normally distributed curve here for those who've had their stats, um, this is a normal bell-shaped curve, which most biological um, uh, mechanisms within the body follow a bell-shaped curve like this. All right, so we have the, um, the amount of need going from low need to high need, and then averages in the middle. And we have the percentage of the population that falls on that. So very few people have a low need for any nutrient that you're talking about. Very few people have a high need, 
most people are somewhere in the middle, as you can see by this sort of, again, the bell shape to this curve. So the EAR it falls directly on this, this 50 percentile line, this average line right in the middle. This is the EAR. So everything below, so if somebody ate the EAR, the, they would have about a 50% chance of being, have their health satisfied by that amount of nutrient that they took in. This is obviously not enough for a lot of people. So this is not what we use uh, when we are giving recommendations out or when the, the government gives a recommendation out. The recommended daily allowance, the RDA, is the type of dietary reference intake that the government wants to recommend and typically does when there's a, a high amount of evidence and they can uh, specifically say what people need. All right, so if they can make an, an EAR, so an estimated average requirement, they can make a recommended daily uh, allowance. Um, and so what the RDA is, is how much intake would be necessary to satisfy 97.5% of healthy people. So almost everybody. So right here at the end of this blue area where it goes white, that is 97.5% of the people. So from here down would be that 97.5%. So most people, if they followed the RDA, they would get what they need. Only about two and a half percent or so of people uh, would not get what they need by following the RDA. I mentioned if we have an EAR, we can get an RDA. The reason for this is the RDA is calculated as the EAR plus two standard deviations. So it's the average plus two standard deviations away, giving you that 97 and a half or so percent of the people who would be satisfied by the RDA. All right, so unlike the RDA, where I have this green light for the adequate intake or the AI, I have a yellow light. And I have that for a reason. It's because an AI or an adequate intake is a lot like an RDA, but it's not as good. And the reason it's not as good is because we don't have enough evidence. We don't have enough agreement amongst the experts in the field or the, the need for individuals is much more varied. Uh, and so it makes it very hard to have these very strict statistical cut points that we need in order to develop an RDA from the EAR. All right. So the adequate intake then is the recommendation that the government gives. So the U.S. government gives whenever um, we don't have sufficient evidence to give a, a better recommendation. And so an example of a, uh, a, a nutrient we actually need a lot of, um, it's the nutrient we need the most of actually, um, that has an adequate intake is water. We don't have an RDA for water, it's an adequate intake. All right, so going on from there, um, we have two other categories. We have the chronic disease uh, reduction intake or the CDRR. And we have the tolerable upper intake level, the UL. Both these I have red lights here um, because these are values that you typically don't want to go above. So the chronic disease reduction intake level is a level that if you go above it, um, you probably won't have immediate problems. But if, you're, if you go above it and you stay above it, you're likely to develop some sort of chronic condition later on. For instance, with sodium, if you go above... Um, the CDRR, you're likely to, uh, you're more likely to develop things like hypertension later on. It's not probably going to happen right away, but later on it might. Um, the tolerable upper intake level is um, a little more important one really to try to avoid because this is the one where you can develop toxicity to the the nutrient by going above this. So if you're going above the upper limits or the tolerable upper upper intake limit or level for a nutrient, you're likely to develop some issues in the much more short term than what you do would with this chronic disease category. So both of these though are categories you typically don't want to go above. Much of the uh, information I'm giving you in this uh, this video, as well as in this sort of whole lecture series, is coming from the Dietary Guidelines for Americans, the 2020 to 2025 uh, edition. Um, so they redo this about every five years. And they have recommendations for various age categories, but I'm going to be focused on the adult category, so uh, 19 years of age and above. And so the macronutrient recommendations uh, for people 19 and above are 45 to 65% of their calories come from carbohydrates, 20 to 35% of their calories coming from fats, 
10 to 35 percent of their calories coming from protein and keep in mind most americans are over consuming protein so most people can eat way more protein than they should and so this sort of trend for uh, recommending eating these very high protein diets is probably not necessarily uh, something we should be doing some general dietary advice coming from that same source is to choose foods that are going to limit your saturated fats to less than 10% of your total calories, your added sugars to also less than 10% of your total calories, uh, your sodium to be less than 2,300 milligrams of total calories. Keep in mind, this is actually going to be lower for people with some chronic conditions like hypertension, where instead of 2,300 being the uh, what you want to be below, it's probably more like 1,500 that you should stay below. Uh, and then the last one on this list, though, is uh, alcohol. Uh, that should be less than uh, or equal to two drinks per day for men, and less than or equal to one drink per day for women. That is if you drink it at all. In reality, um, they just have this on here to try to guide people who do drink alcohol on a regular basis, but it's probably best that you just don't drink alcohol on a regular basis. That would be better than having this the two drinks or one drink per day. And they also recommend having a varied diet where you eat micronutrient-dense foods. So you don't want to eat a bunch of foods that don't have uh, vitamins and minerals in them, basically. And talking about how many calories should come from various macronutrients, we need to talk about um, the daily value and quickly look at a nutritional label. All right, so the daily value is the um, amount of calories that is uh, shown on all of the um, nutrient facts on various foods that you buy in the United States. So they're all based on a 2,000 kilocalorie per day diet. Um, now, not everybody needs 2,000 calories per day, or kilocalories, calories, same thing in this context. Um, some people need more, some people need less. But again, these, these labels are always based on the daily value of 2,000 calories per day. And so when you look at the percentages of uh, the calories that, that you're consuming in this food, whatever this food might be, you know, here it says you have total fats as one gram, it's 1% 1 of your total recommendation for the day. That's based on a 2000 calorie diet, not specifically to your or whoever you're working with calorie, the number of calories they should be consuming. So how do you know how many calories that you or someone you're working with should be consuming then? There are various ways to do this. Um, some of the better ones would be to do some actual measurements. Right, so a couple things, a couple terms you need to be aware of. So the resting metabolic rate is how much energy we need when we are just at rest. So you can see here an example of someone having their resting metabolic rate measured. So they have this sort of plastic hood over their head. All the air coming out of their body is being uh, uh, travel is traveling through this tube, going to this metabolic cart where it's being measured for how much O2 is being consumed by the body and how much CO2 is being made by the body. And so this would be how you could actually measure someone's resting metabolic rate. It's also how you would measure someone's basal metabolic rate. Basal metabolic rate is very similar to your resting metabolic rate, but with some very standardized and strict criterion for determining are they truly at rest. All right, so some of those things are going to be, are they you know, lying supine, like here, the person lying on their back, in a dimly lit thermoneutral room, so not basically you know, around 70 degrees Fahrenheit for the room. Um, immediately after sleep, about 12 hours or greater from their last meal, no physical activity also for 12 hours or greater too. So those are some standard criterion for a basal metabolic rate measurement. Um, there are others that you might find out there in various literature as well. The basal metabolic rate, again, very similar to your resting metabolic rate, just more standardized is 60 to 75 percent of your total energy expenditure for most people. Um, the remainder of that being pretty much uh, your activities that you do during the day, uh, whether it being physical activities, exercise, uh, or just daily activities, you know, going up your steps or, you know, walking across your house or something like that. All right, so your basal metabolic rate is going to vary uh, based on uh, some you know, fairly common characteristics. So it's lower in women than it is in men. It declines with 
uh, with age. So as you get older, it goes down. And it's also related to how much fat-free mass you have. So if you have basically muscle mass. So if you have more muscle mass, you're going to have a higher basal metabolic rate than somebody with less muscle mass. Um, if you do caloric restriction, so dieting and fasting, that is also going to lower your basal metabolic rate. And so um, for if you're trying to if you're someone who's trying to lose weight, exercise with your dieting is going to be better for maintaining basal metabolic rate because the exercise uh, forces your body to sort of keep metabolism up in order to um, keep the, the metabolic processes needed for the exercise happening and to uh, you know, keep normal physiological function. So if you do diet and exercise, it's better than either one alone for weight loss. Going beyond just the resting and basal metabolic rates, what you're really after though is your total metabolic rate. Um, your total metabolic rate is the the what you do at rest, um, but also now adding in your activities you do during the day. So if you know your um, basal metabolic rate and your activities of daily living and your exercises, uh, your exercise and all of those things together, how much they how much energy they require. That is the total metabolic rate. And that's actually the, um, if you have that in calories, that's how many calories you need to consume in order to maintain your body mass. If you eat less, you lose weight. If you eat more, you gain weight. Measuring this is the best, but you can also do this through estimations. Um, so there are various estimate-based equations. There's the Harris-Benedict equation. There's the um, Mifflin St. Jory equation as well. And I will put links below this video uh, in the description to videos I already have showing how to use those equations. In this video, I'm going to be going over some very basic guidelines that everybody should be aware of when it comes to uh, doing some sort of diet in order to uh, maintain or lose weight. Exercise tips for weight control first, because um, I'm an exercise physiologist, this is what I know best. Uh, gradually increase your physical activity over time. Um, if you try to do too much at all at once, you're probably gonna get injured. So a gradual increase is better. It's also something that you're more likely to maintain for the rest of your life, which is really what you need to do uh, with any of these recommendations in order to have lasting change, uh, so lasting weight loss. Um, reduce your sedentary time. Um, so it's not just about how much you're exercising, it's about how much time do you spend being sedentary. So just sitting, doing nothing. So sitting at a computer, sitting, watching TV, those are all sedentary behaviors you wanna to try to minimize and be more active throughout the day. Um, to maintain weight and to prevent weight gain, uh, the general recommendations that you typically see out there are gonna to be to exercise at a moderate intensity, um, doing cardiorespiratory or aerobic exercise, for equal to or greater than 150 minutes per week. If you're trying to lose weight, so if you're not quite at the weight you wanna be and you need to lose weight still, um, equal to or greater than 300 minutes per week of moderate intensity aerobic or cardiospiratory exercise is the recommendation most commonly uh, shown out there. All right, so, uh, you will see a lot of people talking about resistance exercise for weight loss. It's become very, very popular to uh, recommend doing all this resistance exercise for weight loss. And does it have some benefits? Sure. Um, but it doesn't have the benefits that cardiorespiratory or aerobic exercise has. All right, so let's talk about this. Resistance exercise is going to burn far fewer calories than aerobic exercise is going to do, which is the primary reason you're trying to do the exercise if you're trying to lose weight. All right, so it's going to burn uh, less during exercise. Um, it does uh, have some benefit if you increase your muscle mass of, of increasing your resting metabolic rate, which is what people always say whenever they say you should be doing all this resistance exercise to lose weight. But the additional weight loss that you might expect from having that high, slightly higher metabolic rates is pretty minimal. And also the amount of muscle mass you're likely to actually gain through resistance exercise for the average person is pretty minimal. Um, you, you'll gain some, but not enough to radically change 
um, how much, uh, how many calories you need in order to you know maintain uh, your weight, which is what you want to raise if you're trying to lose weight. Because if you raise how many calories you need to bring in, that means it's easier to have a calorie deficit, which causes weight loss. So I've been kind of bashing resistance exercise here in ter terms of weight loss, but that doesn't mean resistance exercise is bad. You should be doing resistance exercise. It just isn't what you should be doing if your goal is weight loss. You should be doing it, but doing it for other reasons. It's good for maintaining bone health. It's good for maintaining muscle health. And it's also uh, has some you know actual benefits for cardiovascular health as well. Just not so great with weight loss, like a lot of people like to say it is. On to some basic tips for diet in order to control your weight. Um, so it's might not be super popular to say this, um, but it is true. The most important thing if you're trying to maintain or lose your weight is going to be to uh, track your calories in versus calories out. So the calories you consume versus the calories you burn. So if you eat more calories than you burn, you're going to gain weight. If you eat fewer calories than you burn, you're going to decrease your weight. If you eat the same amount of calories, whether that's a little amount of calories or a lot of calories, you're going to end up maintaining your weight. So weight maintenance is always going to be the same amount of calories in versus out. All right, so what are some basic then advice basically for um, watching the calories you consume? So uh, watch how many calories you consume through beverages. Most beverages are not going to have a lot of micronutrients in them. So they're basically wasted calories and it's very easy to consume a lot of liquid based calories. Um, so it's probably something you want to try to avoid. Just drink water. It's calorie free. Um, gradually decrease the calorie intake that you do bring in. Um, if you immediately plummet your calories, it's going to be very hard to stick to that. Focus on long-term behavioral change, not short-term weight loss. This is hard for a lot of people. Um, everybody wants to lose weight quickly. Well, people who want to lose weight typically want to lose it quickly. Um, but the focus should not be on the immediate term. The focus should be on the long-term objective of having sustained weight loss that stays off. And the only way to do that is through changing your lifestyle and your behavior. If you switch your behavior um, radically and you lose a lot of weight and you sort of slowly creep back to doing you know, the normal things you do, regardless of what that is, your weight's going to slowly creep back to what it was when you were doing those things that you normally do. So the goal is not quick weight loss. The goal is sustainable behavioral change, which is changing the way you behave both with your exercise and your eating habits so that whatever you reach that as your plateau is something you can keep doing. You can keep eating that way, you can keep exercising that way, and hopefully then you'll be satisfied at that level of weight and that'll be something that um, you, you maintain for the rest of your life. All right, so with that being said, adherence to a diet is more important than the type of diet you are on assuming that you're uh, you're going to be doing a, some form of healthy diet. There are a lot of very unhealthy diets out there. So pick a healthy diet and just stick to it. That's the goal here. It, again, behavioral change, lifestyle change is the goal, not so much short, quick weight loss. Short, quick weight loss is short, quick weight gain once you stop doing whatever you were doing. Um, so if you cannot see yourself doing the diet or the exercise habits for the rest of your life, it won't work for the rest of your life. It'll, whatever you go back to, that's what your weight will go back to. So uh, again, behavioral change, lifestyle change, not quick, you know, dietary and exercise changes. Talking about all this with diet, we also need to talk about how you can then evaluate your diet. Um, the two most common ways of doing this are the 24 hour recall method, where basically whatever day you decide to start, you look back one day and you um, try to write down everything you had that day. Um, and sometimes th this can be done through various sort of survey based questions, and it can give you some estimate of what you're eating. The other very common way of doing it, and probably the slightly better way of doing it, is to do it through diet records or food records. And most commonly, this is done with a three-day food record. So here's our starting point when you decide to evaluate your diet for the next three days. What do you eat? And you just write everything down. The good thing is nowadays there are lots of apps out there that you can get on your you know, smartphone or different devices that you can record things very easily. 
and it will also spit out your you know, how many calories are in it, all the macro and micronutrients that you're consuming. It gives you lots of really great information. That used to be very difficult and expensive to do. It's not anymore. So this is, you know, it's much easier to do these these diet records than it used to be. And with how easy it is, some people actually do it continuously, um, and they just keep track of what they eat you know, on a regular basis rather than just doing it for three days and stopping. Or if you can do it every now and then just kind of give yourself a check. Because it's so popular at this point in time, I don't want to finish this video without talking a little bit about high protein, low carbohydrate diets. Um, generally speaking, you know, you'll see here in a second that it's not something that I think is such a great idea. Um, it doesn't mean that lowering carbohydrates isn't good for some people who excessively consume carbohydrates, especially um, uh, poor sources of carbohydrates. It just means that you don't want to be low on carbs and high on protein. All right, so um, why, why, what are some reasons why I don't think these are necessarily the best uh, diets for you? All right, so you do get quick weight loss with high protein, low carb diets uh, for various reasons, but one of the reasons is because you burn through your glycogen stores, which is your stored glucose within your muscles and your liver, and glycogen is stored with a lot of water. So if you burn through the glycogen stores and you deplete it, you're also releasing the water, which your body will you know, expel out through urine or through breathing or through sweat, and you end up lighter. So you end up lighter though, because you have less water in your body, not necessarily because you have less fat in your body. So that's a lot of the initial weight loss of these high protein, low carb diets is actually water loss. So it's not fat loss, which is the goal with people who are doing sort of um, weight reduction diets. And so uh, just to kind of prove my point here, one gram of, of glycogen stored is stored with 2.7 grams of water. So there's more water being lost than carbohydrates being lost when you, you know, deplete your carbohydrate stores. Most of these high protein, low carbohydrate diets eventually reintroduce carbohydrates at least partially back in. And when it does this, you're gonna at least partially build back up your glycogen stores, which means you're gonna be gaining that water weight back. So it's not, even though it's, you know, it's not the weight you want to lose anyways, it's also weight that you're not going to keep off once you go back to a, a more standard diet with more carbohydrates in it. So it's it's kind of, for this reason, it's, it's not so great. Um, but this, you know, the, you can lose fat weight on a high protein, low carb diet, and you will eventually if you maintain most of those diets. But this is one reason why some of the the weight that you lose is, it's that's a mirage. It's not really fat being lost, some of it. All right, so another reason why um, high protein, low carbohydrate diets are, are not so great, specifically the low carb part of that, is that um, your brain and spinal cord want to use carbohydrates as its fuel source. Normally, it is the only fuel source it will use. Um, when it's forced to, your body can go into ketogenesis and you can go through gluconeogenesis in order to um, get alternative um, keto bodies in order to fuel your brain and spinal cord. Um, but it is not your brain and spinal cord or your central nervous system's primary or preferred, I should say, it's not its preferred energy source. And so initially when you start one of these uh, low carb diets, you're probably going to feel pretty crummy. You're going to be very irritable. You're going to feel sluggish. You're going to have sort of a brain fog and fatigue feeling. And that's because your brain is basically, you know, starving for uh, a couple of days until the ketogenesis and the gluconeogenesis boosts up in order to provide it with other sources of fuel. Some health-based reasons why you should be a little concerned with these sort of low carb diets and high protein diets. Um, low carb diets are associated typically with low dietary fiber diets as well uh, because dietary fiber is basically carbohydrates that our bodies can't break down. Um, and so low fiber diets are associated with digestive issues and um, you know, long term potentially uh, some colorectal health issues. And so you don't want to be on a low fiber diet. The high protein side of this usually means a lot more animal uh, protein than what people would otherwise bring in. And so that usually means a higher fat content and a lot of cholesterol. And this, uh, this is saturated fat and cholesterol that's going to lead to potentially blood lipid issues, so high 
blood cholesterol levels. So it's something that's not good for the avoidance of cardiovascular disease long term. The last major reason I'm going to list here of why the high protein, low carb diets might not be such a great idea is it typically is going to impair your exercise performance. So if you're an athlete or if you're just somebody who exercises a lot in order to maintain your health, uh, it's, it's something that's going to make the exercise harder. All right, so if we look at this diagram here, we have how much muscle glycogen you have. So again, muscle glycogen is the storage form of glucose within our muscles. Um, and that's something that's going to be depleted by a low carbohydrate diet. And then on the, the y-axis here, we have time to exhaustion doing some type of like endurance-based sport uh, or endurance-based event. So cycling to exhaustion, running to exhaustion, something like that. If you look here, uh, again, the muscle glycogen is the lowest on a low carb diet, then on a normal carb, carb diet. Then if you have a high carb diet, so something you might do for a short period of time leaving, leading up to like a, a you know endurance based event where you want to have a lot of glycogen stores, we have various amounts of glycogen based on how much carbohydrate we're, we're consuming in our diet. So again, low carb being on the lowest end, and this is directly related to the time to exhaustion. So low carb diets lead to a small amount of muscle glycogen and a short time to exhaustion. So you get tired faster, basically. A normal diet, slightly more carbohydrates stored and a slightly uh, longer or maybe more, more than slightly longer, but a longer period before you get fatigued doing exercise. And then again, you wouldn't probably want to maintain this all the time, but a high carb diet that's going to lead to more muscle glycogen stores and much greater time to exhaustion. I'm only showing time to exhaustion here, but there are also some studies out there that show various other forms of exercise, including anaerobic exercise, are going to have worse performance um, on low carb diets than normal or potentially high carb diets. Um, so for these reasons, uh, it's probably not great to be on a high protein, low carb diet for exercise or athletic performance as well. In this video, we just went over some very basic information that everybody who is trying to do either weight maintenance or weight loss should be aware of both for exercise and diet tips. Um, I have other videos where I've already talked about what kind of uh, intake we should bring in for macronutrients and um, also some videos on how we can calculate your, your energy need in order to maintain weight, which if you eat less, you end up losing weight. So I'll put links to those in the description below this video.